Okay, so this presentation, we're going to kind of focus on the evolution of life on Earth. And you're going to see that we kind of start off with a, an outer space theme to this presentation. So let's go ahead and get started. So we'll start, before we go into life on Earth, let's just go over the general, general way in which not just our solar system, but we think solar systems in general form. Here we have a picture of what's called a nebula. And we'll go into nebulas in just a moment, but let's focus for a moment on some, on some, uh, some facts about the Earth and our solar system. First of all, the Earth is believed to be about 4.6 BYO, means billion years old. And this number has been reached numerous times by a method of radiometric dating, which we talked about earlier in this chapter. So radiometric dating is where they look at isotopes, and based upon the amount of decay that an isotope has gone through, we can kind of we can mathematically calculate a, a fairly accurate estimate of its age. We know that isotopes will decay at a known rate. So if something is older, the then more time has passed for the isotope to decay, and therefore it's older. If something, if a rock or a fossil is more recent, then less time has passed for the isotopes to decay, and the, the specimen would be younger. So through radiometric dating of rocks, not just earth rocks, but uh, mainly meteor rocks, outer space rocks that have struck earth, we've been able to estimate that the earth and the solar system are around 4.6 billion years old. And so let's reference this picture here. This is one of my favorite pictures of a nebula right here. Nebulas, they have this poetic phrase to them, this poetic name. They're called the birthplace of stars. And, you know, this picture looks quite small. Well, keep in mind, it's a picture from, from a very far distance. This picture was taken from uh, a, a, a telescope, from the Hubble Space Telescope, I believe. And... This is a, a, a image of a nebula, and this nebula has been called the lion's main, or the, the, the lion nebula, the lion's main nebula, I think. And use your imagination, it looks like there's a, a lion's head in the middle of that circle, so the lion's main nebula. And so nebulas, again, are called the birthplace of stars, because what we have is a lot of uh, gas and dust, and, and I'm not talking about dust like you find in your house. But the gas and dust are mainly like hydrogen and helium, and, and these are gases that when they compress, when gravity brings these gases together and they compress, they ignite into fusion, and that is what creates a star. So these are just a few pictures of some various nebula that I just kind of thought were pretty. For all you... Uh, rock and roll fans right here. This, I believe, was the album art of a Pearl Jam album uh, uh, in the mid-90s. But if I'm not mistaken, this is called the Fish Eye Nebula. Looks like a fish eye in the middle. I don't know the name of this nebula. I just thought it was, again, a really pretty picture. And this is also one of my favorite ones. Uh, this is called the Horsehead Nebula. If you use your imagination, you can kind of see a horse head in that cloud of gas and dust right there. And so, again, these are, these are where stars are formed. So gravity will pull this gas and dust together. It will compress, and, and the, the gas and dust will ignite into, into a, so, uh, a star, into a sun. And so this leads us to what we call the nebula hypothesis. So if you follow the pictures, A, B, C, D, E, we have a nebula in area A, and the nebula is being compressed by gravity in area B, it's being more compressed in area C, being more compressed in area D, and so what we no have is, if you notice in the middle, what we have is a sun has ignited, and again, because of a lot of this gas and dust that was in the nebula is compressed due to gravity, and then uh, fusion begins. All that pressure causes fusion, which is the ignition of a star. And so what we see is that a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, as gravity is pulling all this gas and dust to the middle, a lot of solid chunks form uh, closest to the star, and on the edge of the star are the smaller gas particles. And this kind of explains our solar system. 
So we'll go over the solar system in just a moment again, but here we have just kind of an artist drawing here of a of a nebula and of you can see a star in the middle and this gas is swirling and swirling around uh, because of the gravity from the star in the middle. And so this this swirling clumps materials together to form planets. And so what doesn't get pulled into the sun, what doesn't get pulled into the sun forms planets. And if you look at our a picture of our solar system here, if you look at the inner planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, again, what we have are very rocky worlds, very rocky terrestrial worlds. Now, I, I, whenever I see pictures like this, it kind of drives me nuts because this is nowhere near to scale. The planets are not evenly spaced out like you see right here. There's a huge gap. When you get to Mars, there's a huge gap from Mars to Jupiter. I understand why you can't show that in a picture, because, again, you, know, you have limited space to work with. But what gravity does is it pulls the heavier solid objects to the middle, and that's why our middle inner planets are rocky. And the lighter outside planets are gas giants, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. These are gas planets. There, there's no solid surface to walk on. So this kind of, in general, goes over, uh, the, goes over the hypothesis for how we think solar systems form. If we kind of focus on Earth for a moment, well, we know that primitive Earth was very different. And at one time, we believe primitive Earth, primitive Earth did not have a moon. This picture shows an artist's drawing of a large planet-sized object slamming into primitive Earth, this collision just completely destroyed primitive Earth and this, uh, this large object that ran into Earth. But instead of primitive Earth being just completely obliterated, gravity again pulled most of the debris back together with a small chunk on the outside that started rotating around Earth, and we now call this the moon. One reason why we think the moon and the earth were once part of uh, one another is because we, when we landed on the moon and brought back rocks, we noticed that the composition of moon rocks is the same as composition of rocks here on earth. So it's a really good sign that if the moon is made from what earth is made from, they very well could have been this, uh, one at, at, uh, at one time in our history. So let's kind of focus on ancient Earth. Uh, this picture might be a little hard to read based on the quality of the video here, but it says, the primitive atmosphere contains gases, including water vapor that escaped from volcanoes. As the water vapor cooled, some gases were washed into the ocean by rain. So we're going to focus on early ancient Earth in just a moment. And what we know, again, we get this information. We can't time travel, of course, but we can look at things that were around billions of years ago. We can look at little clues, and the best piece of information is in rocks. Rocks are, again, large lumps of minerals, and so whatever minerals are trapped in rocks of, let's say, three billion years old, then that's a really good sign that if there's ammonia in even four billion year old rock, then Earth had a lot of ammonia at, during, during that time in its history. If there's a lot of methane trapped in 4 billion year old rock, then we know that 4 billion years ago, Earth had a lot of methane in the atmosphere. And so by looking at the contents of rocks, we're able to tell that the atmosphere of the Earth had these various uh, components right here. Ammonia, water, methane, and carbon dioxide. These were very abundant at one time in Earth's history. The climate of ancient Earth also very different than the climate today. You know, if the, the, the average worldwide temperature on any given day on planet Earth is something around like 57 degrees. The average worldwide temperature. Very mild. Uh, most people would consider 57 degrees a, a nice, pleasant day. But what, what we know from studying rocks, again, is that Earth was very different billions of years ago. The Earth was a hotter more volcanically active place, and again, we know this from looking at rocks. When we see a lot of volcanic rock, you know, four billion years ago, well, that means that the Earth's volcanoes were more active. 
when we see evidence of heat scarring on rocks, then we know that, again, Earth was a lot warmer. And these are things that, these are clues that we are able to find to make a determination that, you know, Earth a long time ago was very different. And here you see kind of an artist drawing of what Earth may have looked like. Well, one of the things that we mentioned was in the atmosphere was water vapor. And here we have an animation of a process known as condensation. Well, eventually, the climate of the Earth began to cool. The volcanoes became less active. Eventually, the amount of meteors striking Earth slowed down because, again, a lot of meteors were being swallowed up by the sun. A lot of meteor meteors had struck other planets. And so the amount of meteors in the solar system began to decrease. And so the Earth began to cool off. Less volcanic activity, less meteor impacts. And think about what is water vapor? Remember, water vapor is a gas. What does water vapor do when temperatures begin to cool? And that's what this animation is showing. This animation shows a process called condensation. When water vapor cools, it condenses. And that leads to rain. And so even science believes that at one time there was a great flood that uh, helped to create the oceans of ancient Earth. A lot of water vapor from volcanoes uh, were, was released into the atmosphere, and over time that water vapor cooled. Well, you all know the expression, what goes up must come down, and so this helped to form the oceans that we see today. I want to bring up an experiment that was performed in the 1950s at the University of Chicago, my hometown, Chicago. But at, uh, there's a two, these two scientists right here, I, th I believe their names are Walter Miller and Stanley Urey. I hope I didn't flip-flop their first names there. But they did a, an experiment at the University of Chicago in the 1950s. And I want to kind of summarize what their experiment was. They had a hypothesis. They, they, were, they were working under the thinking that, you know, if they try to simulate what early Earth was like, if they try to recreate the conditions of early Earth, would they be able to create organic molecules? Organic molecules are molecules based on carbon that are required uh, by living organisms. Organic molecules like proteins, like lipids, like nucleic acids, like carbohydrates. And so they were wondering, well, what is the spark, literally, what, what, what could be the spark that could have reshuffled these molecules. And so they started thinking, well, what type of energy was available on Earth? Well, they knew that we knew that the Earth was a lot more volcanic. We also know that uh, storms brings lightning. And so they thought maybe lightning could provide the energy to help recombine atoms and molecules. So what they did was they set up a little gas chamber. And in this gas chamber, they added various gases. And you'll start to see uh, some of the gases that they added. Here's one of them, NH2. NH2 is a symbol for ammonia. In their gas chamber, they circulated ammonia throughout the gas chamber. They also circulated H2O, known as water. So they circulated ammonia through this gas chamber. They circulated water vapor through this gas chamber. What else did they add? They circulated methane. Methane's formula is CH4. So water vapor, ammonia, methane. I hope this list is looking familiar. These were circulating through the gas chamber. Well, there's one more that they added, and I hope you remember what it was. CO2, carbon dioxide. They circulated carbon dioxide, methane, water vapor, vapor ammonia, the very gases that were thought to be present in the atmosphere of ancient Earth billions and billions of years ago. And again, they needed a spark. They figured they needed an energy source. So they added a couple of electrodes, which added zaps of electricity. And, and this, these electrodes simulated lightning. We know lightning is fairly common on Earth today. So they figured it was fairly common on Earth back then as well. And this energy, this energy in the electricity did something to these molecules. Look what it did.
the energy from the lightning broke apart the individual atoms of ammonia, water, methane, and carbon dioxide. It broke apart into individual atoms of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Well, we all should know from an earlier chapter that atoms don't like to be single like this because these atoms are all unstable. And what do unstable atoms do? Well, they look to recombine. These atoms look to reshuffle, share electrons, form covalent bonds. And so look what happened in their, at the end result of their experiment. And a weird thing started to happen. These atoms started to recombine with other atoms. And when the atoms started to recombine, they started to recombine into molecules called amino acids. Now, amino acids, you should remember from earlier in the school year, are really important organic molecules to life. They're the building blocks of proteins. And so a, pop, a, a, formula, a formula of an amino acid just popped up on screen. You can see that there's nitrogen in amino acids. Well, that came from the ammonia. You can see that there's hydrogen in amino acids. Well, that could have come from either the ammonia, the water, or the methane. You can see there's carbon in the amino acids. Well, the carbon either came from the methane or the carbon dioxide. You can see there's oxygen in the amino acids. Well, the oxygen either came from water or from carbon dioxide. So when all these when all these molecules of ammonia, water, methane, and carbon dioxide were broken apart, they recombined into amino acids. Later on, other scientists, not Miller and Ure, other scientists were able to do a similar experiment like this and were actually able to recreate nucleic acids, DNA. So these, this experiment showed that very, very important molecules like amino acids and nucleotides, very important molecules to life can be created from inorganic molecules which existed a long time ago in Earth's history. And so that kind of just touches on the importance of Miller and Urey's big experiment here. Remember that a chain of amino acids makes up a protein, and so they were able to prove that organic molecules, such as proteins, others were able to prove that organic molecules, such as nucleotides, DNA and RNA, could be formed without the presence of life. It didn't require a living organism inside of that gas chamber to create these molecules that are very much required for life. One thing I want to stress, did they create life? No. They did not create life in a test tube. That would have been awesome if they did, but no, they didn't. So the reason, again, one of the other reasons why we bring up Miller and Urey's experiment was, again, you know, the thinking that perhaps this could be an early step in the evolution of, of uh, the evolution towards life on Earth. Because we know at one time Earth had absolutely no life on it, but then life uh, began with, we think, prokaryotes. So how did that transition happen? And, you know, science, we don't have all the answers. You know, that we're trying to piece together a puzzle that happened three and a half billion years ago. It's not an easy task to do. So we're trying to find little clues along the way, and the thought is that perhaps this could be one of those clues. So we don't really have a good understanding for how exactly did life evolve from, from nothing into something. We don't have that good idea. And when I say nothing, I don't literally mean nothing, because we know that there were inorganic molecules on Earth, such as ammonia, water, methane, carbon dioxide. But we don't really have a good understanding of how did organic life begin on, uh, on Earth. But again, this experiment brings up possibly a step in the right direction. And so that will be the end of this particular PowerPoint here. So if you want, hit the pause button and try to answer these questions. All of these answers can be found somewhere in this presentation. So uh, if you want, write the answers on a separate piece of paper. I'd be happy to check your answers for accuracy before class or after class someday. So hit the pause button and good luck.